The Church of Jesus Christ has always confessed that the Scriptures are the Word of God written, witnessing to God's self-revelation in Jesus. Where that Word is read and where it is proclaimed, Jesus Christ, the living Word, is present by His Holy Spirit. For this reason, the reading and the hearing and the preaching and the confessing of the Word are central to Christian worship. The Holy Spirit speaks and acts upon us in the reading of the Scripture. Donna will be reading the Scriptures today. Let's pray for the Spirit's help to illuminate our hearts. Let's pray. O Spirit of truth, come now and lead us into your truth. Speak to us the message our Lord Christ wants us to hear. And glorify Jesus by telling us all that the Father has for us in him. Amen. Let's listen to the word of the Lord together. We begin a reading from the book of Acts, chapter, or, yeah, chapter 2, starting in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each, other, each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his native language? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pophilium, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own language the mighty works of God and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, saying, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the 11, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dream dreams. Even on my male and female servants in those days will I pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Our next reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, starting at verse 22. For we know that the whole of creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen it is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches our hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And our final readings start in John chapter 15 for a verse or two, and then shift to, to chapter 16. But when the Helper comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will wear witness about me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. And in 16, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nonetheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but ever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I've been looking forward to this day, and next week too. Um, You know, I I wear the robe on this day not because I feel like I'm anybody special, but to remind you that this is a special day because of what God has done on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost Sunday, many of you know this, you've been taught this, it marks the day we consider to be the beginning of Christ's church, his his people. Uh, 50 days after Easter, Jesus had already been resurrected after his crucifixion. He gave his messages instructions about what's next, and we heard a portion of his discussion with his disciples at that time, just read just now. Specifically, that part which centers on Jesus saying, hey, I, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you somebody who's going to help you, who's going to help you get through this, right? And he reminds 
uh, in this last days, right before he ascended last week, we talked about this, he reminds uh, his disciples that God's kingdom centers on himself, on Jesus. And then right before he disappears, he, he warns his disciples, who are, who are pretty excited and just want to get things going right off the bat. He says, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down a little bit. Slow down a little bit. You need to hang out here for a while. And he says, God will drench you in the Holy Spirit. He just you know, pour out his Holy Spirit on you. So that when go time arrives, you will go out from Jerusalem, out into the whole world, and you'll carry the good news of God's kingdom with you. And you'll have all the power to make it, to make it happen. Right? And so... A few days later, here we are, 120 disciples or so gathered together. It doesn't make it clear whether they're inside or outside or where they are, but then there's this roaring, it says, like a tremendous windstorm. Notice it doesn't say it's a windstorm. People didn't get knocked over, right? But it says it was a roaring like a tremendous windstorm. There's a reason for that. We're going to come back to that. And then little bits of light, I imagine them like candle flames because it said, Tongues as of fire. It doesn't say they were fire. Nobody's hair caught on fire with, you know, nothing happened like that. But uh, tongues as of fire, like little candle flames, set it on, settled on the top of each person who was present there. And then every person in this international crowd. Did you get that flavor? Yeah, Donna drew the short straw on this one today, having to pronounce all that list of names and stuff. She did a, did a great job, uh, right? So it's an international crowd, people from all over. You remember that since the exile, there were more Jews outside of, of Judea, Judea than there were in, right? But people came from all over the place to celebrate the, the holy days, right? But they were speaking the languages of the country from which they came, just like today, right? But they began talking to each other and in their own you know, native tongues and realized, no, wait, I can understand you even though you're talking this other language. That's pretty wild. <laughs> and and, and as, as you might imagine, they got louder and louder as they were chatting and saying, whoa, look at this. Hey, hey I'm going to talk to this guy over here. Can you, you can understand me too. I'm going to talk to this guy over here. You can understand me too. That's amazing. Right? And, uh, these weren't magic tricks, though. Right? These weren't just cool things that, that God did uh, to, to amaze and astound or to entertain people. <laughs> These are signs. These are signs. And sign is a very particular term in the Bible and in theology and in biblical studies. A sign is an act of God that's given for various reasons. Sometimes it's to warn people or bring on divine judgment. Remember the story of the ten plagues of Egypt? Those were signs, something God was doing, judging Egypt, right? At other times, a sign is given to deliver people from oppression, like when the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea. That was a sign, something God did to show, I'm making you free, I'm freeing you from slavery. Or sometimes it's a sign that provides a point of participation in God's miraculous work, God's miraculous protection and salvation, like the Feast of Passover, is a sign in which his people participate, not just watch, but they participate in it. And sometimes a sign is given to demonstrate God is at work here now. God is at work here now, doing something amazing before your very eyes. And this is what those people on that day saw on the day of Pentecost and heard on the day of Pentecost and participated in in the day of Pentecost, right? And these sounds, these signs were a sound like a mighty wind. We can all imagine that. We've been in windstorms before, some of us more, you know, heavier than others. Uh, 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 the, rep, the sound of the mighty wind represents God's life and power coming on his people. We're going to explore that more in a minute. And then there's this, I call it distributed fire. Distributed fire, representing God's presence, not in a mountain or in a temple, but in his people, the ones who love and serve Jesus. And then, I don't know what else to call it, in the title I call it the words, right? We have the the wind and the fire and the words, I, that doesn't really capture it, but it's the evaporation of this language barrier between people. 
You know, my, one of my nephews is, is deaf, and I don't speak sign. And of course, he does, and it, but there's a language barrier between us. And that's, I wish it were different. I have to learn a whole new language in order to just to speak to him. And you've probably been in situations like that before, right? But this evaporation of the language barrier represents how God is bringing all nations, all kinds of people together in his kingdom, no matter where they're from or what language they speak or what their heritage is. He's bringing all people together in his kingdom. So I want to just take a closer look at these three signs. And the way we're going to do it is kind of in, in a way that scholars call a biblical theology way, meaning that I want to highlight for you that these signs don't sit on their own, but they're anchored in the much bigger uh, redemption story of, of Jesus. Because the whole Bible, it's hard to see it because it's very complicated, but it represents one big story. And later in the summer, I'm going to walk you through the Old Testament part of that story. In the fall, we're going to walk you through the New Testament part of the story so you can get a kind of a bird's eye view of the whole thing. But let's look at these three signs, the wind of God's life, the fire of God's presence, and the words by which he creates his kingdom and brings people together in his kingdom. Right? So for insight into the wind of God's life, it, it first helps to do a little... A little um, thing with language here, so to speak, right? It's remembered that the word for spirit in both the Hebrew and the Greek, right? That's if, you, if you're a nerd of any kind, ruach is the Hebrew, pneuma with a P, pneuma is, is the Greek. It's the same word that they would use to talk about breath and also wind. They use the same word, Wind, spirit, breath. It's all the same. So how do you tell which is which? By context, by how it's being used. I can't give you an example at this moment, but we do that kind of thing all the time. We use words that can mean different things depending on the context in which we use them. Now, for ancient people, one of the things this signified is that they understood that breath is life. No breath, no life. God fashioned the first human out of mud, and then what did he do? He breathed into him, and he became a living soul. Right? Not a body with a spirit. He became mud and spirit, a living soul, animated by the breath of God. And we caught that, if you paid attention, in Psalm 104. When God breathes his spirit into the animals they live, when he withdraws his breath, his spirit from them, they die. So, some of you who've read the scriptures well may know this story. Do you remember the story where God showed the prophet Ezekiel a vision of a valley filled with dead, dry bones? We've, we've talked about that from this pulpit before. And God, God's standing there next to Ezekiel and looking over this vista of dried bones, and, and God says to Ezekiel, Hey, Zeke, got a question for you. Can these bones live Ezekiel had been hanging out with God for a while, so he sensed a trick question there. He didn't want to be tripped up on that, so he says, You know, Lord. <laughs> so God tells Ezekiel, Okay, fine. Here's what I want you to do. Watch this. I want you, Ezekiel, to tell the wind from the four quarters of the compass, and I want you to tell what the, the wind to do what I tell the wind to do. And so Zeke does that, and, and the story says that breath came into those dead bodies and they came to life and they stood up and there were thousands of them. Thousands of people. So it's like an army, which gives the image of people who are just waiting to do what they're told to do. Ready to obey the command, right? And God explained to Ezekiel, he said, what does this vision mean? God says, here's what it means. These bones are like Israel in exile. People look at them and they'll say, who... How could that ever come back to life? Israel's gone. They're toast. They're dead, right? But God says, no, no, no. I will bring you, Israel, out of the grave of your exile, and I will put my spirit in you, and you will come to life again, and I will lead you home. That's how God interpreted his own, his own vision that he gave. And if you think about it, you can see how that works for us, because in Christ, the Holy Spirit 
is the breath of God, and he's talking to people who have been as good as dead, and he animates us so that we are his army, ready to live for him and do his will. He draws us up out of the grave of our exile in death and sin, and he stands us up to, to go and do what he wants us to do, to live for him. The breath of God. It's a mighty wind of his spirit, giving life and power to his people. And just note that they didn't hear the gentle breath of God. No, it was a sound as of a mighty wind. Take courage from that. Take hope in that. And then there's the fire. You may also, oh you students of the Bible, recall the story of the burning bush, right? Moses, 40 years a shepherd, sees a bush burning up on a hill. It's burning, but it's not burned up. It's a flame, but it's not consumed. I, I don't know. I think I might have taken a look too, or at least got out my binoculars. Right? But as, God, as Moses approaches, God speaks to him from out of the bush. And he speaks to Moses, and he tells him, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt, and I want you to speak for me. And, it, and he tells Moses, and as you go, I will be with you, and I'll give you the words to say. And it's not just here, but it's many other places throughout the scriptures where fire is used as a sign of God's presence. From the blazing bush, where Moses comes close to the presence of God, is told to take off his shoes, because I'm here, this ground, the very ground is now holy, right? And in the, the pillar of fire, the divine presence by which God escorted Israel through the wilderness. And then at Mount Sinai, which I referred to earlier, where the Lord God descends and speaks out of fire and smoke to deliver his Torah to his people, his, his instruction, his how to, how to be my people instruction to them. And just, let's just pick on a few, one, one more. At the sacrifice of Elijah, you remember that? Before the prophets of Baal? That's an exciting story. Uh, when, uh, when the bull that was slaughtered on the altar, the, the wood that was burning the, the, the bull, the, the water that was supposed to make it hard to, to light, and the stone of which the altar was built were all consumed by holy fire. Woo! Somebody seems to make a movie out of that. And then on the day of Pentecost now, God's presence, God's presence is signified not just by the fact that there's fire, but by the fact that this fire rests on each person in the room. Distributed fire. Shared fire. You've got fire. I've got fire. We've all got fire. Woo! Right? The flame of God's presence, which Jesus said was given to us to guide us, to strengthen us, to teach us, to protect us. Us? Who's us? All who believe in Jesus, give him our loyalty and allegiance and go on to serve him and obey his commands. Fire. And then there is language, right? If you want to talk in, in old-fashioned terms, that's when they say tongues, right? We don't... We don't talk about it that way. We don't go to the French tongues class. We go to the French language class, right? We don't, but that's, that's the old-fashioned way of saying it. But do you remember the story, reaching way back into Genesis, the story of Babel, the Tower of Babel, right? So deep, 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 deep back in human history, um, a, whole, a whole lot of people thought, look, if we all get together and pool our resources, right, we can build a mountain, an artificial mountain that will touch heaven. Because, right, in their way of thinking, the thing with mountains, mountains are tall enough, they actually touch heaven. That's where we can meet the gods, or in our case, God, right? And from there, once we get to the, build this tall mountain that touches heaven, we can take over. We can invade. We can take over things and do things how we want to do them. Now, if you and I were watching a five-year-old trying to build a mountain to heaven or dig a hole to China, we go, oh, that's cute. Maybe take a picture of him to show him later on and embarrass him, right? But God was not amused <laughs> because he, 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 know, he knew that this impulse to reach heaven 
did not come from a desire to do God's will, but to take over. Not to be what God has made us to be in God's way, but to do things our way, right? And yet, in his mercy, God did not destroy them for this prideful rebellion. It says what he did is he confused their language. So they grouped up into nations that each had its own language. So they couldn't cooperate with each other. You ever tried to get something done with someone who speaks a different language? Yeah, tell, tell me some, ask me some time about the story when I was in Germany where I had my first beer ever at the age of 17 and, and how that worked out as an as a exercise in trying to speak to people who didn't know any English and I didn't know any German beyond Dankeschön, Bitteschön, right? Those kinds of things. Um, a language is an interesting thing. It binds people together but then it also creates a boundary between one people and another, doesn't it? But now, by the Holy Spirit, rather than humans assaulting heaven, by God's grace, heaven comes down to earth. A sign that language is no longer... A, there is no longer a true barrier between people. The gospel transcends all uh, of that. God grants unity and peace to people of all nations who give their allegiance to Jesus to follow his way. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to preach a Sunday afternoon sermon to um, Overcomers Church, which is a church of African immigrants here. I was speaking in English. Pastor Clement was translating into Swahili. People in the seats were translating the people next to them into French because these are people from Central Africa, right? And, and a few of them were also translating, he explained to me later, were translating into some other local African dialects as well as, as, as we went along. But you know what? I, I, I'm not saying it didn't matter, because it was, a lot of, it was a lot of work on everybody's part. But we all had one thing in common. Jesus. Shared by his spirit. Right? And it was an amazing experience. So all of this, the wind, the fire, the words, all of these were given on that day in fulfillment of the instruction we heard Jesus give his disciples the night before his death. Or maybe more accurately, the beginning of the fulfillment of his instructions. I have heard it said, and I think it's probably right, we know this book we read from is called The Acts of the Apostles. There are people who say what it should be called is the continuing acts of Jesus and his apostles in the Spirit. And in fact, that's how Luke writes it up if you read the first couple verses of, of the book of Acts. But on that night, before, before his betrayal, Jesus said, guys, I'm, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you the helper from my Father. And it's good, because if I don't go, I can't send. i got to go, Right? The helper is the spirit of truth, and he's going to tell you all about me that you need to know. He's going to make it clear to you what I am up to. He's going to pass my instructions on to you. It was all, it was all part of the plan. It was all part of the deal. So what does this mean for us today? There's all kinds of things I could say, and this is where I struggle with this, is to narrow this down. And I'm going to get a little personal and talk about uh, how I think the Spirit is working in my life right now, hoping it will be helpful to you. I, I'm finding that God is bringing teachers into my life right now who aren't pointing me towards methodology or techniques for being a better pastor, but what these people are pointing me to in the Spirit, I believe, is toward becoming the kind of person who loves as Jesus loves, who thinks as Jesus thinks, who speaks as Jesus speaks, and does as Jesus does. The kind of person. That's an entirely different proposition from becoming skilled at a methodology or effective at a technique. Right? I, I think I'm coming to a deeper understanding. It's not like I've never understood this. 
And those of you who have been walking with Jesus for a while, you know what I mean when I say that. It's not like I never understood this, but I'm coming to a deeper understanding still of how being a disciple of Jesus is first and foremost about cooperating in the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. I've said this before, it's still worth reminding myself of. I, talk, I have talked more about the Holy Spirit in the last 10 years since I, you called me to be your pastor than I did in the last 50 years before that or whatever, right? <laughs> Why? Because it's, it's a, I don't want to say scary, that's not the right word. It's a very serious thing to be called to serve you this way. There's, a, there's an enormous responsibility that's placed on me. And I, coming into it, was well aware that I am inadequate to the task. So if you have criticism of me, just understand, I, I already know, <laughs> right, that I'm inadequate to the task. And so I understood then, even though I understood less then what it means than I do now, that if any of this is going to happen, if God's going to do anything, he's going to do it through his spirit operating through me. Um, making me into the kind of person, the Spirit is making me into the kind of person that Jesus means for me to become. I believe this is true of me, and I also believe that it is just as true for you. That Jesus wants to transform you as well. Now, let me bring this just a little bit sharper. <laughs> and you're going to, I'm going to say this, and you're going to go, duh. It seems to me that prayer is essential to this kind of transformation. Yeah. I, knew you, I knew Pat would appreciate that. Yeah. Eugene Peterson, if you don't know who he is, come see me afterwards, you should. Eugene Peterson said, prayers are tools not for doing or getting but for being and becoming. Prayers are tools, not for doing or getting, but for being and becoming. And see, when you think of it that way, a prayer is no longer a methodology or a technique, but it's opening your life to the life of God as he wants to make you into what he wants you to be. And so I feel a bit like I'm learning to pray again. <laughs> And I have the feeling that I'm, uh, by God's grace, never going to stop learning about that. It's a bottomless well. The Apostle Paul, he connects the work of the Spirit directly to our work, the life of our prayer. In the, in the passage from Romans we reread today, right? He says, all creation groans in pain like a woman in labor awaiting to deliver new life. Now, by God's grace, I've been a close-up observer of that. Never from the inside, right? But I gained some insight from, from that experience. But as, as I alluded earlier, we ourselves, we groan because we're waiting on God to bring about his new life in our bodies. And every day we groan just a little bit more, don't we? We struggle through the pain and we struggle through the uh, tiredness and we struggle through the infirmity, to remember that goodness and beauty of that new life is coming, but boy, howdy, it seems slow in coming, doesn't it? Right? And Paul says, because of all this, sometimes we don't, we don't know how to pray as we should. How do, you, how do you pray for these things? We don't know how to pray as he should, but the Spirit himself speaks to God for us. Oh, thank goodness. So that I can, I can literally kneel in prayer or sit down in prayer and just go, Ugh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and God translates that. <laughs> that's a good thing, because sometimes that's all I've got, right? Our clumsy, our faltering, incoherent prayers, uh, they are translated for us by the Holy Spirit. Prayer, prayer, every time we pray, it brings that ancient day of Pentecost forward into our lives right now. Hear, hear this. This is not just something that happened way back when. 
Pentecost is ongoing now. Don't worry about it that there's no roaring wind. Don't worry about it that there's, you can't see you know, candle flames on our heads. right? Don't, don't worry about it that you can't speak. To, Pentecost is happening now, especially every time we pray. We put ourselves in the presence of God. The Spirit is with us. He hears us. He translates for us. He's there in our prayers. In prayer, the Spirit of God transforms our groaning under the weight of death into the breath of God's life at work in us, the wind. In prayer, the Spirit transforms our sense of God's absence into the flame of God's presence. In prayer, the Spirit begins to transform the hurtful and destructive words that too often come naturally to our minds. Transforms them into words of love and proclamation of his gospel for us and for each other. These are words that call us to repentance. These are words that declare to us his mercy and forgiveness. These are words that work new life in us and bind us to one another. They infiltrate through the membranes of nationality and race and class and wealth and poverty, and they bring us all together in God's kingdom, unified in his life, dwelling together in his presence, speaking to one another the liberating, life-giving words of Jesus. Pentecost, it's still going on. Pentecost is God's pouring out his spirit on his people. And while we don't hear the rushing wind, his life fills us even now as he is recreating us from the inside out. We may not be able to speak the Nepali language that will be in this room just in a few hours. And believe me, they will fill it with the Nepali language. We may not be able to speak French or Swahili of our African neighbors, but what we do speak is gospel, the words of Jesus. That, that compel us to do the works of Jesus. We speak the story of what God is doing in Jesus and how that binds us to our brothers and sisters no matter where they come from. Pentecost is still happening. Let's remember that. Let's live in it and live in the wonder of it and proclaim the great works of the Lord however he gives us the ability to do it. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.